In today's video, we are going to see about the complete overview of the different types of clusters available in Azure Databricks. We can see all of these details by creating a new cluster from scratch. We have already seen about an introduction to Azure Databricks and how to create Databricks instance from scratch. If you haven't watched those videos, I would strongly recommend to watch it before watching this video. Cool, now let's get started. Okay, so firstly to create a new cluster, we can click on this compute button in the left hand side. So now we have different options available to create a cluster. Firstly, we are in the all purpose compute tab. So if we create a cluster as an all purpose compute cluster, then we can pretty much use it for everything. So what I mean by this is, say for example, if you create a notebook inside the Databricks, then you can use this all purpose compute cluster to execute it. Also say for example, if you are creating a pipelines in Databricks using workflows or creating a Databricks notebook activity in Azure Data Factory to run the notebook as a job, then you can still use this all purpose compute to run this notebook as a job. So basically, pretty much you can use this cluster for anything. That's why it is called as all purpose compute cluster. Next we have job compute. So we can create a job cluster if you want to use a cluster just for executing the notebook as a job. So this cluster is not well suited for doing any dev work as similar to the all purpose compute cluster. Instead, it is really suitable for running the notebook as a job, either within the Databricks pipelines or ADF pipelines. So in terms of cost, the price for job cluster will be lesser compared to the all purpose compute cluster. Since the all purpose compute cluster is used for anything, whereas the role for the job compute is just mostly around running the notebook as a job. So that's the biggest difference between the job cluster and the all purpose compute cluster. Next, we have something called pools. What is mean by this is, the pools are a set of idle, ready to use instances. Think of an instance pool as a pool of resources, like a swimming pool. You have a collection of VMs that you want to use for running your data workloads. With an instance pool, you can allocate and deallocate instances as needed. For example, if you have a job that requires a lot of processing power, you can assign more instances from the pool. If the workload decreases, you can release the instances back to the pool for other tasks. Okay, so now we have discussed about all of the different types of computes available in Azure Databricks. So as part of this demo, I'm going to create an all-purpose compute cluster since we'll be using the cluster mostly for the simple development work. Here in the right side, we can see an option called create cluster. So let's click on it. Here we have multiple settings and options to fill in to create a cluster. So it is important to understand all these different options. So let's understand all of these one by one. So firstly in the top, we have an option called policy. Here in the dropdown, we have different types available such as unrestricted, personal compute, power user compute, and legacy shared compute. Among these, if you choose the unrestricted type, we'll be seeing pretty much all the options available to create a cluster. Say for example, if I open another tab and go to the same create cluster page, and instead of unrestricted, I will choose the personal compute option. As you can see here, in the personal compute, we are missing few options here. For example, we have no type here, but we do not have the worker type. Whereas in the unrestricted option, we have worker type, driver type, min and max workers, and several other additional configurations. So these options will not be available in the personal compute. So in this demo, we can use the unrestricted option to create the cluster so that we can understand all of these different settings available. So we have selected the unrestricted option in the policy. The next option we have is a multi-node or single node option. So this is related to the performance of the cluster. The more the number of nodes in the cluster will lead to the high performance in running the jobs and also it leads to high cost as well. So if you need to perform a massive big data analytics operation, then probably you can create a cluster using the multi-node option. And if you're performing a small operation, then you can go with the single node option. So only when you choose the multi-node option, you can able to configure the below settings like the worker type, driver type, min and max worker. 
So if you choose the single node option, as you can see here, we cannot see all the other settings. So this single node type is the same one that is created using the personal compute that we saw earlier. So what this means is, when you create your personal compute, the cluster is created with the single node option. Okay, I will go with the multi-node option since we can understand all of the below settings available to create the cluster. The next option we have is the access mode. So this is an important one. Here we have three options such as single user, shared and no isolation shared. If the access mode is set to single user, then only the person who creates the cluster can access it to run the notebooks. No other person can use this cluster to run the notebook. Also, if you create a cluster using the single user access mode, then we can use all the programming languages that are supported in Databricks to write code in the notebook, such as PySpark, Spark SQL, Scala, etc. And then we have the shared access mode, where the cluster can be shared by any user who can access this cluster to run the notebooks. The downside for this shared cluster is that when you use this cluster, you can only use Python and SQL in the notebooks. You cannot use Scala or other programming languages supported in Azure Databricks. Also to create a shared cluster, we need to have a premium Databricks workspace. And the other thing to note here is, if you want to create a shared cluster, then we need to enable something called credential pass-through. What this means is, this is a configuration which is related to how Databricks is going to access the Azure Data Lake. Say for example, if a user is having access to the Azure Data Lake, then the Azure Databricks will use the same access as an authentication mode to access the data in the Azure Data Lake. Which also means that only when the user has access to the Data Lake, then the user can use Azure Databricks to access the data in the Data Lake. Otherwise, the Azure Databricks restrict the user to access the data lake from Azure Databricks. So that is the concept of this credential pass-through. So this needs to be enabled when creating a shared cluster. Say for example, if I select the shared option, you will get an error message for not enabling the credential pass-through. So that can be enabled in the bottom under the advanced option section. Here we have a checkbox to enable it. So once it is enabled, the error message that we got earlier will go away. Cool, so the next access mode that we have is the no isolation shared option. So this is kind of similar to the shared cluster. The only difference is it supports all language and the other big difference is when this cluster is used by multiple users, then all the users will be performing operations in the same environment there will not be any isolations between the users. Say for example, if one user is performing a massive big data workload, then the other user who is using the cluster will face less performance since there will not be any isolation in the environment between the users. So in the real-time projects, most companies will either use the single user cluster or the shared cluster. So I'll go with the shared cluster option in this demo. Okay, so now we have seen about the policy, multi-node and single node option, and also about the access mode option. The next thing we are going to see is the performance. So this is the important one for the cluster. So all this option is related to the performance of the cluster that we are creating. Here, firstly, we have an option called Databricks Runtime Version. So if I click on this dropdown, you can see all the Spark versions available in Azure Databricks. All these versions are categorized into two types, standard and ML, which is machine learning. In the standard option, you can see all the different versions of Spark clusters. So the latest one as of today is the Spark 3.4.0. You can basically use any of these versions for creating your clusters based on the type of libraries that you're using in the code. So these versions will be updated frequently by the Databricks team. Also, we have a separate category for machine learning, where we have different types of high-end compute with GPU enabled, which is more suitable for doing machine learning task. So what I'm going to do is, in the standard option, I'll go with the default version, which is 12.2 LTS. Okay, so the next option we have is the use photon acceleration. So what this means is, for example, if I see the information, as you can see here, 
the photon accelerates modern apache workloads reducing the total cost per workload so basically if you enable this option this will improve the performance if you are using multiple sql based codes in the notebook with the minimal cost which is a great added benefit for now i'm not going to use this option in the future if you need for some reason we can enable this okay so the next one is the important one which are worker type and driver type firstly let's see about the worker type so this is where we'll be getting the cpu and memory for executing the spark jobs so we all know that when we perform any operation using the databricks notebook the underlying built in spark engine does different kinds of partitioning and distribution techniques automatically for us to improve the performance so for the spark engine to do this it needs a certain amount of cpu and memory so this can be obtained using the worker node option there are different types of worker node available with the different cpus and memory so as you can see here we have the general purpose category with more than 48 types of worker node available and there are other different categories as well so you can pretty much configure the worker type based on your workload so it go with the default option which is the standard ds3 after choosing the worker type you have an option to configure the min and the max workers so you can configure this based on your workload say for example if you have set up the max worker as 8 and while performing a massive big data operation the spark engine will use the maximum of 8 worker nodes to perform the operation which will improve the performance drastically and while doing the minimal workload it just uses the minimum number of workers to perform the operation so we can also enable the below checkbox which is enable auto scaling to dynamically scale the min and max workers based on the workloads automatically so basically all of this is related to the performance so the higher the number of nodes leads to the high cost as well we have different kinds of worker nodes type available so each will have different cost associated with it so i have your microsoft documentation opened in another tab so this is the azure pricing for the databricks cluster here you will have information about all the worker nodes and its associated cost elements so you can refer to this documentation and pick a one that will better suit based on your requirements okay so now let's move to the next option which is driver type so as you can see here the default one is selected as same as worker configuration this means that the driver type will have exact configuration of the worker type and in this case which is 14 gb memory and 4 cores so basically what does this driver type means is it is responsible for managing the overall execution of the spark application coordinating the task and collecting the results you can think of a driver node as a team leader say for example when you need to perform any operation the driver node first identifies what are the different types of tasks needed to perform that operation and then it drives the worker node to perform the actual operation and once the worker node finish running the operation the driver node collects the results and finish the task so in simple terms you can think of the driver node as the team lead who identifies the different tasks needed for an operation and the worker node is actually performing the task as instructed by the driver node so i'm going with the default settings for the driver node which is the same as worker configuration so now let's move to the next one So we have already seen about enable auto scaling option so let's see about the below one which is terminate the clusters on inactivity so what this basically means is when you are not using the cluster in databricks the cluster will automatically turned off after 120 minutes based on the default settings so this is really important one to configure to save some cost so i'm going to reduce the time from 120 minutes to as low as 15 minutes So now even though i forgot to turn off the cluster the cluster turns off automatically after 15 minutes of inactivity which will save some cost for me okay so now we have given all the information needed to create a cluster now what i'm going to do is for this demo purpose i'm going to just create a cluster using the single node option the reason i chose the multi node option is so that we can see all the different configurations available to create a cluster in azure databricks We have seen about all the settings available to create the cluster. Now I don't need a multi-node cluster since we'll not be doing any massive big data workload for now. So what I will do now is I will choose the single node option and click on this confirm button. Here I'll go with the default settings for all and I will just update the cluster inactivity minutes from 120 to 15 minutes. Okay, so now we have given pretty much everything to create the cluster. 
So before creating the cluster, let's change the cluster name to dev cluster. And now let's click on the create cluster button. Cool, the cluster is getting created. I think now you have some understanding about how to create a cluster in Databricks and also about the different configurations and types of clusters available in Azure Databricks. I hope you found this video useful. In the upcoming videos, we can see how we can use these clusters to perform different kinds of data engineering operations. So that's it for today. So if you found this video useful, please like, share and subscribe and see you in another great video. Until then, cheers. Bye.